Good morning, everybody. Welcome again to another virtual service. You know, someone asked me the other day, they said, how are you preaching to an empty room? I mean, that must be terrible. And I said, yeah, it's really not as bad as you think. I'm looking at the camera, but I'm picturing all of you at home or wherever you are watching this. Of course, in my vision of that, uh, everybody loves what I'm saying. I mean, there are people saying amen. There's nobody going to the bathroom in the middle of the service. There's no crying babies. All my jokes are funny. Uh, people are nodding their head and smiling in agreement. You know, it, it's just, of course, I'm kidding a little bit. I am looking forward to being back in person so much. I'm sure you are as well. No matter whether you're an extrovert or an introvert, this is getting a little old. Uh, we do hope to be back together soon. Watch Facebook to find out about that. Of course, we're really leaning into the, the governor's regulations and guidelines, and just like everybody else. And probably, the truth is, we'll probably take it a little bit slow as a church coming back together because of some of our vulnerable population. We're going to take all the precautions that we can, but hopefully we're, we're on the home stretch and we pray that we are. Happy Mother's Day uh, to all you moms. We celebrate you today. We acknowledge you. We stand with you. We're in all of the women in our church, young and old. We're so glad you're a part of our community, our family, NCC, and, and we want to give you the, the warmest, uh, happiest Mother's Day. I hope it's uh, just filled with blessings and family and good food and, and good times. Uh, and I also want to acknowledge those who are women but find this day particularly difficult. I know there are many that this is one of the hardest Sundays of the year. In fact, you may be barely listening and, and ready to tune out, and I hope you just stay with us today. Um, we're, we're standing with you as well. Maybe it's the struggle of infertility. Uh, you've known the pain of a miscarriage, the loss of a child. Uh, or maybe you've lost your own mom, maybe even recently. And this, this is a very painful memory uh, today, especially a reminder of that pain. And so we stand with you as well, all of our, our women uh, today. Today is the conclusion of our series, I Want to Believe, But. This is looking at some of the big barriers to faith. And I found, I know for me, it's been very encouraging to preach on these messages, to strengthen my own faith and allow God to do a deeper work in me because it doesn't matter whether you're a skeptic or, or a seeker or sitting on the fence or whether you're a, a believer of many years. Uh, there are barriers that we have that sort of stymie our faith, these thoughts about God. And today's message is so uh, similar to that. In week one, we talked a little bit about this idea today of suffering and why does God allow bad things to happen to good people. And maybe we deduce that he's a heartless God. I want to believe, but God is heartless. That's the topic of today. And I want to relate that in many ways to Mother's Day. I want to connect the dots of that and, and see God for, through a different lens, the opposite of heartless. He really is the God of compassion and tenderness and care and love. And, and I think so many of us have felt and experienced it and know it. But some haven't, or some are on the other side of her, or some are yet to dive in to see just how loving and tender and caring and compassionate he really is. I want to believe, but God is heartless. Uh, maybe it's because he hasn't answered my prayers. Maybe it's because I, I feel the pain of, of a loss or a sting uh, uh, of some, some problems in my relationship. Or, or maybe it's the loss of, of income or so many other things. Uh, I, I've noticed that when we start to twist our view of God, that is, we have just a small view of Him or a slightly wrong view of Him. This really comes from the devil himself. I just read this morning in my devotions, the devil's a liar. He's the father of lies, which means he's the originator of all of the lies. It's his job to lie to us. And from the creation, he lies to us about God. That's his favorite kinds of lies. Why? Because as soon as we have a wrong view of God, our lives get off course. Just a little view of God that gets wrong. We're way over here. And if we keep walking down that path, of course, we're further and further away. So the devil loves to lie to us. And I think one of the big lies he has is God is heartless. He's not with you. He's not tender. He's not compassionate. He can't forgive you. He's not close. He's distant. Uh, that lie is called deism, where God just sort of is there. He wound up the clock of life and then walked away to let us figure it out. A lot of people have that view of God, even many Christians. But it's just not who God is. 
This morning, I want to do something a little different, and it's to look at God as maternal. That's right. I know. Some people, maybe this is a little uncomfortable, and it's true. God is properly understood in the Bible as he, and it's true that Jesus became a man, and it's true that one of the top metaphors of God in the Bible is father. All of those things are true, and there's nothing heretical that it's also true that sometimes in the Bible, God is seen as maternal. And I want to talk about my top four maternal attributes of God in honor of Mother's Day, but also because they're the opposite of God is heartless. And we see in these maternal attributes, which are often neglected in the church, maybe for some reason we're just a little nervous of that idea, but they're loud and clear in the scripture, as we'll see today, and they'll help us to see just yet another more fuller view of the God of the Bible, the God that we love, the God that loves us. And so uh, let's dive right into those top four. The first one is this, God gave us birth. That's right. God gave us birth, according to the scripture. Now, there's many things in life that women can do that men can't do. I think we all know that. We all acknowledge that. If you're married, you definitely know that. If you're not married, you know that. I mean, for instance, women are able to stop and ask for directions. There's no man on planet Earth that has ever done that. I mean, there were cavemen riding around on dinosaurs once, just lost in the middle of the wilderness, their wives just shaking their heads and rolling their eyes because they wouldn't ask for directions. We all know this, this is true. Uh, another one is women can multitask better than men. That's just uh, our experience. But also, I've noticed a few studies recently, fascinating, to tell us what we already knew. They proved that, as a matter of fact, that women can multitask better than men. That is, they can have multiple windows open, spinning things and doing many things, whereas a man generally is going to be fixated on the one window open until they get that done, and then they'll move to the next one. But the biggest thing they can do that men can't do is give birth. And that is a God-given blessing, a reality, something very beautiful, something very profound. And so that God gives us birth is one of his maternal attributes. Deuteronomy 32 Verse 18 says it clearly. You did not think of the rock who gave you birth. You forgot the God who gave you birth. There are verses like this throughout the scripture. This one is talking to the Israelites who had gone into idolatry, who had turned away from God at this point, as they had so many other times before. And when they did, the scripture says, why would you forsake the very one that birthed you? And in the context, actually talking about a physical birth, not a spiritual one. It's God who physically birthed you into this world. Of course, he does that through the moms. But it's God's care and tenderness and love and sacrifice that initiates that. And we also see in the Bible in many places that, of course, God gives us birth spiritually that those who would call on the name of Jesus are born again. They have a new birth. It's of the Spirit. It's through the Son. John 1.18, or James 1.18 says, He, God, chose to give us birth. He chose it through the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of all he created. God was pleased to choose us, to give us birth spiritually, that those who would call on the name of Jesus would have a renewed spirit, be born again, and know a rebirth. So we were born once physically, we were born again spiritually. Those who would, by his grace, choose by faith to follow Christ. And I hope you have this morning. What a blessing that God gives us birth. And you know, in birth is a kind of sacrifice. There's a kind of giving up of oneself. Every woman who's given birth knows they give something away. They give a piece of themselves away. They give a part of themselves away when they give birth each and every time. And any, even any dull male like myself who has witnessed several births of my own children, that you know there is something profound and beautiful and sacrificial about it where something is given away. 
I remember when my first child was born. I'll never forget it, of course. And it was such a powerful day, and I was so nervous. I was a young man, my young 20s. My wife and I were spinning with this and just didn't know what end was up. And she had a very difficult birth, and she had a, a, a difficult labor, and it was long, and it was painful, and she couldn't take an epidural. And I was so afraid, and I, I, just, I just couldn't take seeing the pain that she was in. It, it really unnerved me, and yet I was trying to have my strength just to be there with her. And my whole view of her changed. I had always viewed my wife as she was very petite and frail, and I'd just seen her as, as sort of breakable, to be honest, up until that point. But my whole view of her changed indelibly on that day, and it's, it's the same uh, today as it was then, that she showed herself to be so strong that she could endure something that I could never do. And I was so uh, impressed, really, in a way, afterwards with what she went through and how she did it and the sacrifice she did so that we could start a family. Uh, it made me love her more and respect her even more. Uh, and so many people know this experience. And that's a reflection of God because he is ultimately the one who gives us birth. And he's the one who, through Jesus Christ, gives us rebirth, that he would give up in, a, in an ultimate sacrifice, his only son, and, and have to, he would have to die for us so that we could be reborn. That, that sacrifice the nth degree. Of course, mother's sacrifice doesn't end a childbirth. It only begins a childbirth. Amen, moms? You know it in COVID-19. You are given some sacrifices right now. Dads are too. I don't want to take that away. But I was just speaking to the moms this morning. The sacrifices that you give, good moms, it just goes on and on and on. And I'm sure you're a good mom. And uh, I, I read a, a story about a math teacher who was talking to their class uh, online and, and trying to do virtual school. And they were asking the class if they had a piece of, if they had a, a pie and the pie was cut up into seven pieces for the seven people who were in their family, mom, dad, and five siblings, including themselves, what fraction of the pie would they have? One little boy raised his hand and said, well, I would have one-sixth of the pie. And the math teacher said, no, that's not right. You know it'd be one-seventh. I think you've got to study your fractions a little bit more. And the boy said, no, you don't know my mom. My mom always says, I'm not really hungry. You can have my piece. And it's just a little anecdote and a reminder of, of what is so generally true of good moms. It's just the way they live lives. I know I can speak about my wife to our children. She's so quick to give up of herself, to give her share away. And that is part of what we see in God himself. Now, remember in the beginning in the creation, which I alluded to earlier, God created humankind. He created male and he created female. And then it says he made them in his image. It never says he made male in his image, but not female. It says he made male and female in his image, which means we in our best selves have the attributes of God within us. And it's not completely clear which attributes are male or female. Obviously, there's many that overlap. But there are some as we'll see today, that I believe are given to the creator to female, that actually we shine back, women shine back to their creator to give him the glory and the praise. And one of them is given birth. A second one is a good mother. Like a good mother, God is our comforter. Like any good mom, he comforts us. He cares for us. He is nurturing, compassionate, tender. Isaiah 66, 13 says it, as a mother comforts her child, so will I comfort you, and you will be comforted over Jerusalem. This is God speaking, and he says it as a metaphor. Just as a mom comforts her children, I will comfort you, my people. And it's the same true today as it was then for God's people, his church, his, his bride, the, the Christ followers, the Christians, he says, I will comfort you. Isn't that good news? That is a great quality of God, and, and he links it to a maternal quality. So it's just like, just the way moms are with their kids, a good mom with their kids. It's such a beautiful thing. Now, I remember when I was a little boy, my, my parents uh, were still together at the time, and I 
occasionally take a sick day from school, but I never wanted to be sick if my dad was home taking care of me. Nothing against my dad, great dad. Um, he was a shift worker, so some days he was home, some days he was working at the fire department, but I just didn't want to be sick with dad taking care of me. I always want a mom to take care of me. Anybody like that? I don't think I'm alone. You know, dads, and a generalization, but it's often true, they're just not very good at it. You're, you're sick. They're like, you know, hey, uh, it's fine. Just uh, fend for yourself. There's some soup in the cupboard when you get hungry. I'll be out in the shop doing my thing. Uh, don't forget to do your chores. And I don't care if your temperature's 103. You're fine. You know, uh, just get over it. Mom w was much more gentle, much more compassionate. She would make me the soup. The soup tasted better. You know, I don't think I'm alone in that. In this comfort, God says there's a maternal quality, and he wants to comfort you. In the New Testament, we read the words of Jesus in John 14, 16. And he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever. And this is very important because we're talking about the Trinity and there's a profound mystery of the Trinity. God is one God, but he's in three unique persons. It blows my mind. It ought to blow your mind. Father, Son, Holy Spirit in loving unity and community with each other. And the advocate here is the third person of the Trinity. Jesus says, when I leave the earth, now we're going to have the Holy Spirit poured out on all of my people. And his name is the advocate. This is the word paraclete or parakletos which simply means the helper. Now, many translations of the Bible, notice, they translate this as the comforter. And you've probably heard that term, the comforter has come, the helper has come. We live with a God whose purpose primarily is to help us, is to indwell us, is to give us everything that we need, is to love us, to nurture us, is to, to lift us up when we're down, to point us to Christ, to give us a better life, to... to be there with us. That's the Holy Spirit. That's why it's so profoundly disturbing when people just quench the Holy Spirit, neglect the Holy Spirit, just walk in the flesh, go their own way, because you're the only one missing out when you do that. God says, I, I've given you the comforter, and, and he is the greatest gift that you could ever get, is to receive Christ and to receive his Holy Spirit and to have that indwelling you. What a beautiful thing. Number three, like a good mother, God is our protector. One of the top maternal attributes of God in the Bible is protector. Now, you might not think protector first. Maybe you think dad's protector, and dad should be. But so is mom. Have you ever seen a mother with their children when their children are under attack? I mean, get out of the way, right? I mean, can I get an amen? It's pretty, it could be fierce. And the Bible taps into that and, and relates it to God. Now remember, God, I don't want to make this clear, God proper, the, God the Father, as we call him, is not a human being. Jesus came as a human, as the second person of the Trinity. But God is spirit, so he is not male or female. He is God, he's the spirit. But he has shown us these male and female attributes, so-called. In Deuteronomy 32, 11, it likens God to an eagle mother over its young. It says, like an eagle that stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, that spreads its wings to catch them and carries them aloft. Now, don't miss this word picture. It is very beautiful. God is the mother eagle, and his wings are outstretched. And we are like these little, I guess they're called eaglets, and we're pretty pathetic, but he loves us, and, and he's protecting us, and, and we're in the shadow of his wings. And he's not going to let any danger come to us. He got us right there in his nest. But it's also important, because right here in this verse, it says that he stirs us up, too, and he's ready to catch us when we fall. That means that he's also not just satisfied that we just stay there and stay immature. He, he's letting us grow. He's letting us out of the nest. He's ready to stir us up if we're not doing the right thing. And when we fall, he's going to catch us. He's not going to let us crash and die. That's a great picture of God. It's a maternal picture. And we see this picture in other places. Jesus, in the New Testament, on several occasions, says that he's like a mother hen. 
And he wants to gather up his chicks under his wings. Very similar concept. Maybe borrowing from Deuteronomy. Well, I'm not sure. The eagle picture is a little bit more uh, poetic for us, at least the way we understand uh, animals today, I think. But the same is true of a mother hand to his chicks. She's, she's going to protect them. She's going to gather them up, it says. And he says, how I long to do that. There's a maternal love that he has for his people, his little ones. And then there's this one. Hosea 13.8 is a little more obscure, but it talks about God as a mother bear that is robbed of her cubs. This metaphor got me. Now, in the context, he's actually, there's actually some ferocity there of the mother bear, even toward her own cubs for, for doing what's wrong. But what struck me here when I read this one is I had just finished watching the movie The Revenant. I, I'm re-watching it. Um, you know, COVID-19, we're a little bored. We're re-watching movies. But I enjoyed that movie, and it's a little brutal. I'll warn you if you haven't seen it. And in this scene, in that movie, if you've seen it, you know. Early on in the movie, Leonardo DiCaprio's character, he's a fur trader in the 1820s, is out on an expedition, and he has his uh, musket aimed at some bear cubs. He's probably thinking dinner. But what he doesn't know is mama bear is coming right over his left shoulder. And it, and it's, it is a very realistic, brutal scene that it enacts. I mean, this, this mother bear just rips him to shreds, just throws him around like a rag doll. She ain't going to protect her little ones. There's no way he's going to shoot them. And he, she leaves him for dead. And again, it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult scene to watch. But that's all I could think about when I read Hosea 13.8 and was thinking about this maternal attribute of God, that God as the mother bear of her cubs is ferocious, protective, watch out, don't mess with these cubs. And there is some of that as we walk through the Bible, the sense that God is not going to let the evil one get the best of us, that he, he is going to protect us. That, that is so comforting to me. And then number four, top four maternal attributes of God that we see in the scripture, like a good mother, God will never, he will never, ever forget you. He will never forget you. A good mom gives birth to her children. She sacrifices for them. She protects them. She's watching over them. She's comforting them. And there's no way, even a, even a halfway decent mother on earth would ever forget her children. And this is a picture, and I save the best for last, that we get of God. In Isaiah 49, verses 15 to 16, it's, it's asked this question. Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Could she ever forget that little child? Of course, the answer is incredibly no. But then it says, though she may forget, so in a rare extreme circumstances, you might get a person who could forget, a mom who could forget. Still, I will not forget you. God could never forget us. He's the eternal, perfect, matchless God who loves you and saves you, and he will never forget you. And then it says, I have, see, I have engraved you on the palms of my hand. So there's a couple things going on here. Firstly, this maternal attribute of God that says, likens him to a nursing mother and the baby at her breast, this one that she is weaned, and then later on, would she ever forget that one? No. Even when these children are long gone out of the house, and I'm starting to know this as a parent, it still dominates their thoughts, dominates their conversations when they're out for dinner. Most parents who are empty nesters are still thinking about their children. Why? Because there's that connection. And I think in a unique way to moms who gave them birth. And God says, it's like that. I will never forget you. And then he goes further. He says, you're engraved in the palms of my hand. This word engraved in the Bible is the same word for tattoo. Did you know that God has a tattoo of you right here on the palms of his hand? Not anywhere where he can't see it. It's a memory, the best place he can see it, to always have you on his mind. 
Of course, God doesn't have a physical body. This isn't meant to be literal, but this is the way it is in the spiritual world, that God loves you so much that he remembers you constantly. Only God could do that for all the people in the world for all times, but he can do it. He's the infinite, and eternal, matchless God. He can think of all people at all times, and he has each of his people on the palm of his hand uniquely engraved, tattooed. Now, many moms want to remember their children even beyond their own affinity to them, and they might have a token they carry around. I mean, I always have my pictures of my kid on my cell phone, and I'm, I'm fast to show all my kids if I'm on a trip. I, I really want to show off my family, and I say, here's my, here's my four children, and I brag about them, and you probably do the same. Some moms will have tokens. Uh, some moms have a necklace with something uh, unique about one or all of their children on there, or maybe a bracelet or some earrings that represent them, or even an actual tattoo. I've seen women with tattoos of a, a footprint of their baby or the date of birth of their children. It's a very similar concept we're talking about here in Isaiah 49, saying God has a tattoo of you. Because you even imagine we're talking about God. And yet we're going around thinking he's heartless. We're upset because he didn't maybe answer my prayer exactly the way I asked it. We're upset because the timing of my life hasn't worked out, even though, if I'm honest, I'm the one who made the mess. When the God of the universe is thinking about me day and night and loves me like this, in this maternal way, this powerful way, this profound way, how could we ever mistake him for a heartless God. And I want to say one more thing. For those of you struggling with guilt and shame, which is probably 90% of the people watching, when you think about what the Bible declares, what God himself declares about himself and his relationship with his people, the people who have called upon the name of Jesus Christ to be their Lord and Savior, to walk and follow after him, Make no mistake, we're talking about Christ's followers. He is saying that no matter what you've done, no matter what your past is, no matter what you're trying to run away from, no matter how bad you have fallen, no matter what sin, you name it, I forgive it if you come to me in repentance and faith. I will cleanse it. I will remember it no more, and I will still remember you with fondness. I will still love you. I will still accept you as my children right in the here and now. I will still accept you into my kingdom in heaven for eternal life. No one is perfect, and many people fall far short of the glory of God. We all do. And some have these sins that haunt them too. And God says, through the blood of Jesus Christ, I can forgive you. Come to me in faith. Believe that I will wipe it out, and I will do that. That is part of what we're talking about here in Isaiah 49. So I hope that this is helpful. To encourage you, maybe many of you, for what you already knew. Maybe for some, but just a new shade of meaning as we think of God as maternal. I know for me, it's not something I think about all the time. But the Bible, if you read it carefully, has many of these references in a maternal way to our awesome God. And I think they also give tremendous blessing to the women in our lives, in our church, in our society, in, in, our, in life on earth, because each of us is a reflection of God's glory. We all carry his nature that he's given us, his image, male and female, and we all can shine in the way that he's wired us for his glory. I want to conclude with this um, story. It's a fictional story by Irma Bombeck. She used to be a, a longtime columnist uh, and journalist, and I thought it'd be a fitting way to end this. Uh, she wrote about uh, a fictional piece of God creating mothers that I thought would be a fitting way to end. She said this, an angel said to him, that is God, Lord, you sure are spending a lot of time on this one. And the Lord turned and said, have you read the specs on this model? She is supposed to be completely washable, but not plastic. She is supposed to have 100 moving 180 moving parts, all of them replaceable. She is to have a kiss that will heal everything from a broken leg to a broken heart. She is to have a lap that will disappear whenever she stands up. She is to be able to function on black coffee and leftovers. Six pairs of hands, said the angel. That's impossible. 
It's not the six pairs of hands that bother me, said the Lord. It's the three pairs of eyes. She's supposed to have one pair that sees through closed doors. And so that whenever she says, what are you kids doing in there? She already knows what they're doing in there. She has another pair in the back of her head to see all the things she is not supposed to see, but must see. And then she has one pair right in front that can look at a child that just goofed and communicate love and understanding without saying a word. That's too much, said the angel. You can't put that all into one model. Why don't you rest for a while and resume your creating tomorrow? No, I can't, said the Lord. I'm close to creating someone very much like myself. I've already come up with a model who can heal herself when she is sick, who can feed a family of six with one pound of hamburger, and who can persuade a nine-year-old to take a shower. Then the angel said, looked at the model of motherhood a little more closely and said, she's too soft. Oh, but she is tough, said the Lord. You'd be surprised at how much this mother can do. And when I read that, I I felt like it connected to some of what we're saying, also honoring moms today and all of our women, young and old, for, for Mother's Day today. But I love this line, when God said, I'm close to creating someone very much like myself. And as the scriptures prove this morning, that is very true, that he put indelibly into our women, into our moms, something very special that we can see God. And in that, we can see that he is not heartless, but he loves us very much. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we just want to thank you that you show us the Father. You said anyone who sees you sees the Father. And we see you so clearly, and we want to thank you that you've given us a fuller revelation of who you are through the Scripture. And even though I'm sure we're just getting a glimpse of the mysterious nature of God, may we take that in. May we not believe a wrong view of God. May we not believe any lies of the devil that would throw us off. But instead, Lord, that you would show us who you are even more and reveal our own hearts to us, our own insecurities, our own sins, our our, our own defaults in our own patterns so that we become more like you, that we wouldn't get off on some tangent. And we pray, bless all the women of our church, young and old, and we pray that they would be so blessed this very day, family and loved ones and showers around them of just of so many blessings, Lord. And this would all be for your glory, and that through them we could see the imagers of God that they bear witness to how incredibly loving you are, and may we all be better for it. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Church, we want to thank you for gathering online, whether you're doing this with the live broadcast at 10 or you're watching this later. Of course, that's fine. We hope to be with you in person uh, in the next few weeks, but who knows? We just can't put a timetable on it. I do want to let you know that we're starting a brand new series next week. And it's, I, I feel really excited about it. I think it's going to be really, really good. It's called Messy, Loving Others Isn't Easy. And you're going to want to tune into this. It's a four-week series. Truth is, we had another series planned, but we scrapped it because of COVID-19. It felt like this one, I think, is really going to be more relevant. So tune in. Uh, don't forget your giving if you're part of our church home. You can do that online, as we said. And have a wonderful Mother's Day.